But that town in eastern Kansas certainly does have a storied past. Uh, just a little over 100 years ago, on August 31st, 1910, uh, former President Theodore Roosevelt mounted a kitchen table on the grounds of the 22-acre state park uh, he was helping to dedicate in Osawatomie, uh, John Brown State Park, and delivered what has gone down in history as his new nationalism speech. It certainly wouldn't have gone down in history as his John Brown speech uh, since the fiery abolitionist who had battled pro-slavery raiders on that spot in the days of bloody Kansas uh, snagged only two cursory mentions uh, in TR's speech. Uh, much to the relief of his advisors, I should add, who knew that TR was one of those politicians who also regarded himself as something of an historian, uh, although the corporations of his day weren't about to pay him for his historical advice. Uh, the, the new nationalism speech would be described by one of TR's many biographers, George Mowry, as, quote, the most radical speech ever given by an ex-president. His concepts of the extent to which a powerful federal government could regulate and use private property in the interest of the whole, and his declarations about labor, when viewed with the eyes of 1910, were nothing short of revolutionary. On December 6, 2011, uh, President Barack Obama returned to Osawatomie, and standing on a platform somewhat more secure than a kitchen table, uh, explicitly embraced the underlying philosophy of TR's new nationalism. Uh, why a Democrat, a member of a party which customarily recurs to the other Roosevelt, especially in hard times, uh, should in this instance have embraced the Republican Roosevelt, will no doubt be explored today among many other issues uh, in this discussion we're about uh, like to hear. Like TR, uh, Obama identified with Lincoln's measured but radical pursuit of emancipation. Like TR2, Obama presented himself as a transcendent leader, as, Ray, as, as Roosevelt famously put it in Asawatami, as the steward of the public welfare, who could rise above polarizing economic conflict of his time, who could rise above special interests to serve the interests of the whole people. And just as TR sought to navigate a purposeful third way between socialism and capitalism, so Obama promised to be a post-partisan leader who would heal the rancorous Democratic and Republican struggles over the welfare and national security states. President Obama's speech in Osawatomie invites comparison with Teddy Roosevelt's address. Roosevelt's address on a quick reading, I know you were all required to read it, so I did as well, it seems to me more compelling than President Obama's. It certainly, in Teddy Roosevelt's style, is more energetic. Giving the advantage to, uh, in this judgment, to Teddy Roosevelt, I suppose, is almost fixed in the card. For who in this situation is copying whom? By coming to Osawatomie, Obama was paying homage to the originator, even as I'm sure that he hoped to be seen as outdoing him. I doubt in that case that he succeeded. And for good reason, Teddy Roosevelt had more time to prepare his address. He was perhaps the deeper thinker. And of course, he had sought counsel from the likes of Herbert Crowley, as distinct from David Plouffe. But questions of uh, style aside, Teddy Roosevelt defined what he thought was the central issue of his time, and he sought to address it. Historians tell us that the concentration of power and wealth was, in fact, the central issue of his time. Whatever President Obama is thinking, no one, of course, can know. But his Osawatomie address clearly evades the central issue of our time, and thus fails the test of real statesmanship. The central issue of our time, at least domestically, is the massive imbalance between what government now promises and the resources allocated to pay for these promises. Call it, if you will, the sovereign debt crisis. On this depends the fate of our national security, the soundness of our entire economic system, and justice for the generations to come, for every act of indebtedness is attacked on the next generation. The most glaring one is that the crux of the new nationalism and all of the fights over the Constitution in the original progressive era uh, w w was about the political reform agenda. I mean, that's the whole progressive movement was about political reform to establish social and industrial justice. That's what it was. It was the, the wedding of political and economic reforms. 
um, Obama is really, in his speech, trying to restore faith in the post-war order. Uh, and even more uh, contemporaneously, 90s era prosperity. This isn't arguing for a whole new system of government in some ways, a whole radical rethinking of how we, we do things. He's trying to get back to the American dream of the post-war era and some of the prosperity of the Clinton era. Um, there, there really is no fundamental challenge in Obama's address to the political order. Uh, there's no real talk about the re reforms on the level that, that Teddy Roosevelt talked about. Um, and there was really no, no, no uh, concrete way to break this federal power, corporate power nexus that is animating both the Tea Party uh, and Occupy Wall Street. So in his own Osawatomi speech, President Obama dons PR's progressive mantle. Not nowhere near as high-minded as, as TR in the first place. I agree with the panelists, but he does it nonetheless. He does allude at the beginning to an, an America where hard work pays off, responsibly is rewarded. Anyone could, take, could make it if they tried. But that was the argument of his parents in earlier generations. This basic bargain has become so eroded by the marketplace that the defining issue of our time, he says, is to restore growth and prosperity, balance and fairness. Here's that word. The choice we faced, as he frames it, is that offered by the progressives 100 years ago, at least uh, that aspect of progressive economic uh, choice. Between the harshness of market capitalism, which he defines in true straw man fashion as you're on your own economics with a free license to take whatever you want from whoever you can, social Darwinism, on the one hand, and the benign fairness of progressive nationalism view that we are greater together when everyone engages in fair play. Everyone gets a fair shot. Everyone does their fair share. The word fair occurs throughout the speech, not opportunity, uh, with reminders throughout that things must be made fair, and that means government. As a nation, we've always come together, he says at one point, through our government, through progressive fashion. So he returns to his old mantra, not a bold and new uh, initiative, but his old mantra, federal education programs, infrastructure, economic regulation. And of course, raising taxes on the wealthy is the way to pay for those investments, and that's only fair. Why did Barack Obama give this speech in Osawatomie, Kansas? And he gave this speech, I think, because he wanted to redefine what was the central issue uh, in American life. And I think in the first six months of 2011, uh, President Obama really went along with the uh, narrative that uh, Jim uh, offered for the country uh, and really seemed to accept that the fiscal problems facing the country were the most important. Um, and it was a battle in which he uh, did not uh, do uh, particularly well in public opinion. And I think he didn't do particularly well because I don't think that was ever at the center of uh, Barack Obama's presidency. Solving our fiscal problems was a part of a larger objective. And so I think by giving that speech, um, President Obama really challenged the very definition of what is at the center of American politics. 